It's hard not to be curious about what made Ireland the one and only English-speaking country to not have fought alongside the United Kingdom during World War II. It's even harder, though, to imagine how it managed to stay that way under the pressure of both sides to choose an enemy. In this sense, in answering why Ireland chose to remain neutral, we will first answer what joining the war would have meant for the country. At the start of the war, relations between the United Kingdom and the young Irish states' governments were diplomatic at best. Although Ireland had a long history of conflict with the British Crown, the decades between the two world wars were especially tense. It's the 1940s, and Ireland is not seeing the United Kingdom as an ally, but also it fears a German invasion. But in August 1940, the first German bombs are being dropped on the Irish soil. Because you are a fan of our channel, we encourage you to definitely check out our favorite streaming service for educational content, CuriosityStream. Here you will find thousands of educational movies covering a wide range of topics, including very well-made documentaries about our favorite subject, history. As an example, I recommend the series Winston Churchill, A Giant in the Century. This documentary is about the life of that man who ruled the United Kingdom during its darkest hours. A very well-structured documentary about the whole life of Winston Churchill. While watching, I realized that near the United Kingdom is a country that is not so mentioned during this period, Ireland. You can watch this amazing documentary about the life of Winston Churchill for free. Because you're our subscriber, you get free access to thousands of documentaries on CuriosityStream. Click on the link in the description and use the code NOLEGIA when you register. By doing so, you will get 30 days of free access to the entire library of videos, and you will greatly support our channel. While having merged with the United Kingdom in 1801, Ireland underwent, like many other countries, in the second half of the 19th century, the exponential growth of nationalism among its population. The rising national identity didn't take long to become a self-government movement. And by 1914, those in favor of an independent Ireland carried out to the British Parliament the known as Home Rule Act, which gave Ireland self-government sovereignty, although within the United Kingdom. World War I nonetheless postponed until after its end the promulgation of this act. Yet it was never promulgated. In 1919, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, who three years before had unsuccessfully declared Ireland independence, started a guerrilla war against the British. Fought mostly in Dublin and Belfast cities, the Irish War of Independence accentuated the identity tendency of Catholics and Protestants, supporting independence and loyalism respectively, which resulted in the partition of the country between Ireland and Northern Ireland in 1921. Ireland was then a self-governing state. Shortly after, as is frequent in recently independent countries, a civil war arose between those in favor of remaining part of the British Empire and those against it. Backed up by the Crown, pro-British forces won and founded the Irish Free State, a constitutional state part of the British Commonwealth, and as such, subject to royal authority. The struggle was not settled though, and in 1937, near the start of the war, a second Irish constitution supplanted the Free Irish State with what we know today as Ireland. Behind this new constitution, which removed the king as an authority figure, was head of state Eamon de Valera, a key figure in Ireland politics. By the time this new constitution was adopted, de Valera had a long history in the country's political conflicts. He took part of IRA's Republican Insurrection and Independence Declaration, and was also one of the political leaders during the War of Independence. He was in favor of the defeated anti-Commonwealth forces during the Civil War, and him founding the Fianna Fáil party as a new approach toward total independence was key in Ireland reaching such objective. The transition, though, did not lack friction between Ireland and its former overlord, Britain. Economic disagreements led to nations applying important fees to one another. 
The so-called Treaty Ports, a set of three Irish ports, one north and two south, under British control since 1921, settled the trade war by returning to Irish hands in 1938. Churchill objected this movement due to the strategic position the ports could have in an imminent war. Intuiting at the same time that De Valera would not let the British use them. In this way, when De Valera addressed to the Irish people the state position of non-belligerency concerning the already in-process European war, he did so in the faith of expressing the sovereignty of the country. That is to say, to show that they were not associated with the British, which asked Ireland to come to their aid as soon as they request it, more than to any other country. But once the war started, Ireland was forced to make the decision of remaining neutral over and over again. On the one part, Britain's interest in Ireland entering the war did not diminish. The next year after the start of the war, the British were as far as secretly offering de Valera what he wanted more than anything. A potential unification between Ireland and Northern Ireland as a single Irish state. In exchange, the Irish were to allow their land, ports, and airspace to be used freely by the Allies. Under these terms, the Irish government was also obligated to deport every citizen from the Axis countries from its land. Still, the deal did not imply that Ireland was obligated to make a formal war declaration. Although at first it may have looked like a tempting offer, De Valera did not accept it. Why? Firstly, only after De Valera accepted the deal, a proposition for unification would be proposed to his northern pair, Prime Minister James Craig. De Valera did not trust him, and reaching an agreement would be complicated at least. Distrust aside, it can also be interpreted that the Irish did not see a clear winner on the conflict. As in 1940, the war was still open. Yet at the same time, shortly after rejecting the unification offer, De Valera let know the British that he was rooting for them, and that if Ireland was to enter the war as allied, the Germans could invade Ireland. That is to ignore, nonetheless, that the British Royal Navy defended Ireland's sea, and that British troops up north were positioned to intervene if the Germans were to attack Ireland. By the time of the war, the Irish Navy only had around 50 ships, and an equally short aircraft force. Its army was of limited size as well, restricted to less than 30,000 soldiers and the country did not increase its military expenditure that much after the war arose. But despite its neutrality, Ireland did not remain alien to the war. As early as it started, Dal Arín, Irish main legislative chamber, declared the state of emergency for the Irish government. Conceived to remain active until the end of the conflict, in political terms, the emergency granted the government a set of extraordinary powers, such as media control and acute intervention in the economy. As such, their lack of military strength did not limit Irish propaganda's efforts on using its limited army assets to ensure the population that the country could not actually defend itself of any enemy. On the other hand, the Allies were not the only band looking for Ireland to join the war. Churchill's 1940 speech against Ireland's refusal to declare war on the Axis was, at the same time, joined by a German military offer, which Valera refused by treating with arrest to German emissaries if they were to land on Irish soil. Shortly after, Ireland was bombarded resulting in three casualties and 24 wounded. And again the next year, when allegedly mistaking Ireland's coast for England's, Germans bombarded many times the country, resulting in more than 30 civil casualties. There are even documents that support a German plan on invading Ireland. The so-called Operation Green, a complementary part of Operation Sea Lion, which targeted the UK. In this sense, neutrality during the conflict was kept even after actual hostilities. Irish ship MV Curlogue, for example, despite suffering damage by the Allies and the Axis weaponry, keep neutral politics and even intervened in rescuing soldiers from both sides. As the US entered the war, Ireland's importance in changing the war tides diminished. 
Yet Ireland indeed chose a side and secretly supported the Allies. For the one part, Irish citizens were still then British subjects, were free to join the British lines. Allied aircraft were also granted entrance to the Donegal Corridor, allowing them safe access to and from the Atlantic. On the other hand, the Irish Air Corps, as well as its naval service, assisted Allies by sharing them aircraft identification over their territory. Similarly, in planning the Normandy landings, hourly Irish meteorological reports aided the Allies in choosing when to attack. We can say that Ireland's apparent neutrality was a sovereignty exercise, both regarding their brand new relationship with the UK and with the political world scenario Churchill, who had long loathed Ireland's leader, took advantage of de Valera's mistake and declared him to be uncooperative during the war, if not an enemy whom the United Kingdom should have undertaken. Valera's response came only three days later in the form of a pondered statement of principles and a synthesis of the motives that made Irish neutrality the only viable choice for defending and shaping its sovereignty. De Valera addressed the fact that if Ireland would have entered the war, Britain's necessity would become a moral code. While in responding to Churchill, menace of invading Ireland, he responded that it would have meant another horrid chapter of the already blood-stained record of relations between England and this country. We would like to give special thanks again to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. Also, a big thank you to our supporters on Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.